What's going on, A-Push Nation? This is Mr. Majewski. I am getting you through the middle of the World War II notes. Uh, and we're starting with, uh, what? let's go to it here. Let me exit out of this screen here. If it'll allow me. Here we go. Uh, we are le we're right at the Grand Alliance, which is showing for me as Roman numeral number five. Uh, and I think it matches up with yours. It is right after a Japanese internment, which we finish up in class. Um, so, uh, we're going to get right into it. Uh, the Grand Alliance is the term we use to describe the United States and all of the Allied powers that teamed up together to fight against the Axis um, during World War II. Uh, most definitely, FDR and Winston Churchill were the two leaders, the two heads of the Alliance, uh, most definitely the two most public figures. Obviously, Stalin is another major player as well. Uh, the objective uh, is clearly, as I already mentioned, Germany first, right? Remember, take Hitler and Germany out first. Uh, that is the priority uh, before Japan. Uh, some Americans disagreed, but ultimately that was the strategy that was agreed upon. S Churchill insisted on it. Uh, the military strategy was four parts. One, they wanted to blockade Germany and Italy uh, economically. So use the powerful navies to prevent any goods from getting in uh, to Germany and Italy. That would be a good start. Then... Massive air attacks on Germany. They're going to bomb Germany uh, as much as possible. Uh, the third part of that was uh, to start striking what we would call Mediterranean targets. They want to hurt what, what is called take out the soft underbelly of the Axis. So don't attack Germany directly until you've weakened them enough. Almost like if you're in a fight with somebody, you would repeatedly hit them in the body to tire them out before you would go for the knockout blow. Uh, so they're going to take out North Africa, and then Italy, and then they'll open the front to end the war. Uh, now remember, uh, that's the strategy against Germany. Uh, in the early stages of the war in the Pacific, things go very poorly, as we've already discussed. Um, remember, Japan takes almost all of Asia. They take the Philippines. Uh, 20,000 Americans um, are, uh, are forced to surrender. Um, to the Japanese, they're taken uh, in a death march, a march across the uh, main island of the Philippines, uh, 85 miles, they're force marched, uh, many of them die along the way, others are burned alive when they get to uh, their final destination. This gives you an example of the brutality uh, with which the Japanese treat specifically prisoners uh, during the war. Here are some American soldiers who had been taken prisoners when the Philippines fell. Many of these guys, unfortunately, will get caught up in the Bataan Death March. They're in it, actually, at the time. Uh, and so clearly, some of those folks would not survive. Uh, anyways, Douglas MacArthur becomes the new commander of the Pacific Army, or the Pacific Forces. Uh, so it's going to be Eisenhower in the Atlantic, uh, and the overall commander, uh, and then MacArthur uh, in the Pacific, Douglas MacArthur. Okay. Uh, turning points, well, in Europe, we've got a couple of turning points. The first is, and it doesn't involve the United States at all, so we're just going to mention it. Remember, Stalingrad is the turning point in Europe. It's where the Germans are finally defeated in Russia. It's where the Soviets finally stop them and begin to push them back. Germany can only fight a defensive war from this point forward. And again, that kind of shows you uh, Stalingrad was the furthest they ever got afterwards, the Soviets immediately started to push them back towards Berlin, towards their capital. Uh, also, North Africa. The Americans' first fighting actually was not in Europe. It was in North Africa. We led an invasion of North Africa to liberate those countries from Nazi rule. It was called Operation Torch. As I mentioned, General Eisenhower was in charge. It was a success. Germany gave up North Africa. So the first fighting the U.S. engaged in in Europe, North Africa, a success. Now we're going to focus on our next target, which was Italy. The Allies invaded Italy in 1943. We seized Sicily, which is the boot of Italy. Uh, and then we slowly marched up the, uh, the country. We seized Rome. Um, and uh, while there were German troops in Italy, in northern Italy, until the end of the war, Rome was captured in June. Um, and... Uh, uh, and by uh, 1944, uh, the Allies were prepared uh, to now launch an invasion of France. That invasion is considered the most important of the war, at least for the Allies, for the Western Allies. 
Uh, it's called D-Day, or the Invasion of Normandy. It's also known as Operation Overlord. That was the code name for it. Um, it it uh, was 120,000 American and British and Canadian troops landing on the beaches of northern France. Um, and ultimately, it was a success. Okay, Obviously, if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, you've seen the famous opening scene where they storm the beaches based on true stories. Here we go. We have Americans that are storming out of the carriers as they storm the beaches, trying to get onto the beach uh, and up on up to the cliffs above. Here's American soldiers that are emptying from that ship. Um, uh, in this image, only six of those 36 uh, actually made it to the beach. The rest are going to be mowed down before they even got out of the water. Okay, what a tragedy. Uh, there's the Normandy Beach at the end of the day, after the Americans have successfully seized it. Um, and are prepared to start moving across France and eventually into Germany. Why was it important? Because it established that Western Front, that second front, so that the Soviets don't have to do all of that fighting in the East. Now the Germans have to fight that two-front war, war on two sides at once, uh, and all they can do is really defend on both sides as they slowly get squeezed together. Uh, in fact, by August of 1944, already... Just two months after the invasion, the Allies enter Paris. They liberate Paris. Uh, they by the end of the summer, they had captured all of France, including uh, and also Belgium and Luxembourg. Um, and uh, ultimately, it's a major success, uh, and the Allies slowly, not really slowly, even they begin to sweep across France. Uh, in anticipation of their invasion of Germany, the Allies bombed Germany. Uh, on levels that really had never been seen before. These are images, actually, of German cities that were bombed by conventional bombs, just bomb after bomb after bomb after bomb. Um, and they look, in some ways, almost as bad as the uh, atomic bomb images that we will see. Um, so they bombed Germany around the clock, both the British and the Americans. Every major city was leveled. Uh, there was one major conflict that the U.S. fought in uh, as we were entering Germany from France. Uh, it's called the Battle of the Bulge. It was named because the map that the generals were using um, had a big black stain, kind of like a bulge on it, uh, to demonstrate where the American and German troops were located on it. Um, anyways, it was the last major German offensive of the war. It was their last gasp. They took their remaining reserves and tried to achieve a knockout blow against the Americans. Uh, they were unsuccessful, and afterwards the Allies just moved even faster towards Berlin, the capital. By that point, Hitler was doomed, uh, and his time was limited. Uh, the British and the Americans continued their massing bomb massive bombing of German cities. Uh, they firebombed Dresden, which was a special type of bomb that hit, exploded, caused concussive damage, and then led to fires. 100,000 German civilians were killed. Uh, most factories, most rail lines were destroyed. Again, just massive devastation by American and British bombers against the German cause. Uh, Hitler eventually realizes that he is really just in command of Berlin at one at, by April of 1945. He's really lost command of anything beyond that. Uh, the Allies are closing in on him. Uh, he does not want to surrender to the Soviets. Um, he knows that the Soviets will put him on trial. They'll embarrass him, they'll humiliate him, and they'll kill him and probably torture him. Uh, so he commits suicide instead. May 7th, 1945, the Germans surrender to the United or to the Allied cause. Uh, so Germany was out of the war. We call that day VE Day, Victory in Europe. Uh, it's a massive celebration across the world, and particularly in the United States. Uh, we still had Japan to worry about, however. Uh, and boy, we still had some big decisions with them to make. Uh, but the turning point against Japan actually went all the way back to 1942. Uh, it was called the Battle of Midway. It's easy for us to remember. It's midway in the war. It takes place at a Midway Island, which is about halfway between the Hawaiian Islands and Japan. Uh, it's the turning point because just like Stalingrad prevented the Germans from ever uh, fighting an offensive war again, uh, the Battle of Midway is the turning point because afterwards Japan can no longer actually consider an invasion of the U.S. They no longer have the naval power and strength 
um, afterwards. Now they too can only defend and hold on against the more powerful American and allied cause. The American strategy against the Japanese is called island hopping. Uh, remember, we would start at an island that we captured and then we'd, we would use it to hop or jump to the next important island along the way as we bounced or hopped towards Japan. Uh, that is Douglas MacArthur, the famous American commander uh, in the Pacific. Here's the U.S. island hopping strategy. These blue lines kind of show how we jumped from island to island to island on our way to get closer to the Japanese. Uh, the red indicated the furthest empire the Japanese ever had at their peak during the war. Slowly, we grind away at it, we chip away at it, until ultimately the Japanese are really just going to have Japan left again. Uh, important battles along the way, important islands along the way. I want to draw your attention to this spot right here. That's Iwo Jima. We're also going to talk about Okinawa right there. Uh, Iwo Jima, 62,000 American casualties, so big losses there. Of all of the 22,000 Japanese troops on the island, only 216 survived. The rest fought to the death, refused to surrender. Uh, U.S. fighter planes, after seizing Iwo Jima, were now close enough to uh, bomb Japan um, round the clock. Uh, Okinawa was the next major island, the last island before we got to Japan. Um, and again, fierce fighting, 50,000 more American casualties. The fighting was so fierce, it was so brutal. Uh, that the U.S. government decided while fighting in Okinawa, we're not going to invade Japan and have this happen on a much larger scale. We'd rather drop the atomic bombs on them. Uh, just like Germany, before we dropped the atomic bombs, we dropped massive amounts of conventional regular bombs on them. We destroyed entire cities, uh, not even with the atomic bombs, but before them with our regular conventional ones. Tokyo, for instance was devastated. Here's an image of Tokyo that kind of shows that level of destruction. All right, that's Mr. M signing off. Uh, that's really all the notes that you're going to need on the fighting in World War II. I do, however, want to hit on uh, the Roman numeral 10 aftermath and everything after that as well. We don't really need to cover it in class. I do want to spend some time in the video chatting about it. Uh, the aftermath of the war. Everything in between uh, these videos we will cover in class. Or I should say everything in between what I covered earlier uh, and what I'm covering now. Um, so if we didn't cover it in class, it's covered on this video. Uh, anyways, aftermath of the war. Well, first off, the war was, I mean, just almost fi over 50 million casualties. Uh, 50 million dead, 35 million wounded. Uh, the Holocaust alone, 12 million people died. Not only that, but 30 million Europeans lost their homes. So, I mean, we're talking about hundreds of millions of people that were dead, wounded, missing, homeless as a result. Europe was devastated. It was completely wiped out after this war. Uh, the level of death was staggering. Obviously, some countries suffered more. Those who were in it from an early stage obviously suffered a great deal. Um, during the conflict. Uh, the U.S. and the Holocaust, obviously we need to reference this. Uh, one of the most horrific incidents or scenes, not incidents, uh, uh, effects of the, of the war was the Holocaust. Six million Jews murdered by Germans, uh, the Nazis during the war, six million others as well. Um, Basically, any group that the Nazis believed to be inferior or different or from mainstream. Uh, they're like an extreme, violent, fascist, um, nativist organization. Um, the United States obviously was horrified by the Holocaust, but we do need to recognize that the U.S. didn't probably do as much for European Jews either before or during the war. Uh, we were a pretty anti-Semitic society, so there was a lot of bias, there was a lot of bigotry against Jews. Uh, remember, we have multiple incidents of it with Father Charles Coughlin, with Henry Ford, uh, with others from the 1920s as well. Um, the Americanism only contributed to this anti-Jewish mentality. Remember, many Jews were Eastern European, 
Uh, they were viewed as outsiders. Uh, they needed to be limited. Uh, during Nazi control over Germany, the most famous example of American resistance to Jewish refugees uh, was when 900 Jews aboard a passenger ship, the St. Louis, were denied access by the U.S. Uh, of course, we now know most of them later died in Nazi camps. Um, of course, at the time they were denied, uh, the U.S. public didn't know, obviously, uh, that Jews would later be exterminated by the Nazis. Needless to say, it demonstrated American nativism, isolationism, um, and didn't obviously look good in retrospect. Um, some critics argued the U.S. should have done more during the war once we found out about the camps to try to stop them. Uh, but obviously, Americans didn't really recognize uh, the level or the significance of this until afterwards. Um, of course, uh, these are uh, images of uh, General Eisenhower and other Army um, military officials inspecting some of the camps. Uh, troops uh, were walking past, were walking prisoners past the camps uh, so that the prisoners could claim that it ne could never claim that it didn't happen. Uh, they had seen it for themselves. Uh, here we see uh, the General Eisenhower and others uh, showing how prisoners had been abused, mistreated, tortured by the Germans, uh, kind of a mock simulation of what had actually happened. And of course, one of the devastating images of the survivors who uh, are clearly, uh, in some instances, uh, on the brink of death. Uh, political... Uh, Post-war political issues. Uh, obviously, the war feeds very much into our next set of notes. Uh, and as we know, um, the war was a victory for the Allies, but it opened rifts. It opened disagreements between the United States and the Soviets. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, there should be rifts between these two groups. One is communist, one is capitalist, one is democratic, uh, and the other is not. Uh, and so they had all the more reasons to disagree and dislike one another. Now it's actually going to happen, now that the Nazis and the Japanese are out, Japanese are out of the way. Uh, next issue is going to be Eastern Europe. What are we going to do with it? The Soviets want it. Stalin wants it for himself to help the, help Russia or the Soviets rebuild. And of course, those are going to all be one after the other, turned into communist puppet governments that are run by Stalin. Germany is going to be divided into four zones. Uh, one for each of the victorious allies to run. Um, Europe is going to decline somewhat uh, in, uh, in, in terms of significance. Um, but, uh, well, we, the synthetic materials absolutely are going to start to rise. Uh, we're going to have improvements in planes and radar uh, that have changed the war. Uh, and, of course, the A-bomb is massively important as well. Those are the changes to American society as a result of um, the war. And these are the changes you really need to know and you really need to think about. Uh, the end of the Great Depression, the rise of consumerism and post-war economy after the war, demographic changes, we have the Sun Belt Movement, we have the Great Migration, we have the baby boom that's going to happen after the war. Of course, can't forget about Japanese internment. The role of women in society during this time is, is just profound. And of course, after the war, we're going to finally end this isolationism and adopt internationalist beliefs, really, from this point forward. It's Mr. M signing off. We'll cover everything else in class. You take care, folks.